My name is Jennifer Grisham. I'm from the United States, from the University of Kentucky. Uh, many people in Europe know about Kentucky because of Kentucky Fried Chicken or because we have bourbon that comes from Kentucky. Uh, those are the two things that we're known for. Uh, at the University of Kentucky, I'm a professor, and uh, in that uh, role, I train children who are between the ages of birth to uh, six years of age with and without disabilities. It's called the Interdisciplinary Early Childhood Education Program because we train teachers together in a blended program. I am also the faculty director of an on-campus early childhood center for children with and without disabilities that are between the ages of birth and five years of age. I am glad to be with you today and to talk to you about a topic that I'm very passionate about, which is authentic assessment. Much of my research has been around how to promote authentic assessment practices and also how to include children with disabilities in typical early childhood settings. In our short time today, I will be talking to you about what is authentic assessment, why we do authentic assessment, and how we do it. So um, I will proceed at this point. I first of all want to uh, define what is authentic assessment. My colleague, Christy Pretty Fronsek, and I have a book that is coming out uh, in a couple of months uh, that describes authentic assessment as a practice of evaluating children or assessing children, gathering information about children within the context in which they spend time at home or in a community-based program. We're assessing them on skills that uh, the children need to learn, the children need to know in order to be successful in those environments. And so, for example, if a child is in their home and they need to learn skills about how to communicate with their family, or they need to learn skills about how to move around their environment, those would be the skills that we would assess. In a classroom setting, children need to learn how to interact with their peers. They need to know how to uh, get their needs met. They need to know how to follow a social routine. And so those would be the skills that we assess. Um, with authentic assessment, we are using materials that are part of that environment. So unlike other types of assessment that you sometimes will see with young children, we are using materials that are part of their regular environment, uh, materials that they play with, materials that they are interested in, materials that they need in order to accomplish that activity. And then finally, authentic assessment is accomplished with people who know the child well. Uh, we don't have people that are unfamiliar to the child uh, pull them to a location where they are uncomfortable uh, to try to assess them on skills uh, with materials that they're unfamiliar with. Some other words that we use for authentic assessment are we sometimes call it play-based assessment because we are, we are actually watching children as they interact with their environment, doing things that they like to do. It's sometimes referred to also as naturalistic assessment because, as I said, it is conducted within the natural environment. And others also refer to it as performance-based assessment. Um, performance meaning we are seeing how they perform, how they act on their environment, how they interact with the materials in their environment. And so the, the next question that we want to ask now that we know what uh, authentic assessment is, we want to know why we do it. And I think the best way to talk about why we to do it is to contrast it with what we sometimes refer to as conventional assessment. <laughs> with conventional assessment, uh, we oftentimes do this because we are trying to figure out what the child <laughs> cannot do so that we might perhaps be able to um, qualify them for early intervention services. Uh, and so if that is the case, then sometimes what we do is we're trying to focus on what is, what is wrong with the child, what the child cannot do. It is oftentimes a one snapshot, a very small period of time. We might do the evaluation uh, for one hour with the child. And what we are trying to do oftentimes is to bring the child to a center or to a location that they are unfamiliar with, with people that they are unfamiliar with, and we are focusing on um, situations that may not, that may penalize a child who has a disability, because we know oftentimes that children who have disabilities, they are uncomfortable in locations that they are, un that they are unfamiliar with. 
with authentic assessment, um, the observations occur over time. It is not just one point in time, but it occurs over time. Um, it focuses instead on deficits, it focuses on the child's strengths, and it also focuses on their emerging skills, where, they, where we go next with this child. Uh, it's, as I said, located, it occurs in locations that are familiar to the child and involves real life tasks, um, how a child gets dressed in the morning, how a child plays with their brothers and sisters, how a child plays out on the playground, how a child feeds themselves and eats at school or at home. It's in those kinds of real life tasks that we do authentic assessment. The other thing that differs it from conventional assessment is that with good authentic assessment, it allows for adaptations and accommodations for children with disabilities because we are looking at functional skills. And so, for example, if we're working with a child who is nonverbal and that child uses pictures to communicate or sign language to communicate, then authentic assessment says it is okay for the child to perform skills in that manner. If the child uh, is immobile and the child has to use a wheelchair to get around and move around their environment, it is okay to add a, adapt the assessment items on the tool and observe the child to see if they have the function of being able to move from one location to the next. And so um, some of the concerns that we have about conventional assessment are, first of all, that it does not meet uh, recommended practice standards. Um, oftentimes, the families of young children are not actively involved in a conventional assessment. Um, they receive information about what is wrong with their child, why that child needs services, what kind of services they can get. But it, the recommended assessment practices says that the family needs to be actively involved in that process. There is also no evidence base that um, conventional assessment uh, produces positive outcomes for children. Uh, in some of the research that I have done, we have noted that when we compare authentic assessment and conventional assessment, that we produce better outcomes for children and that the quality of the environment is better when teachers use authentic assessment practices. In one of the studies that I did, we compared the language and literacy environment uh, in programs that did not use authentic assessment to the language and literacy environment of programs that used authentic assessment. And we found that the programs that used authentic assessment had a higher quality early language and literacy environment than the programs that didn't use it. Also with authentic assessment, it often doesn't match the goals of the program. If the goal of the program is to include children with disabilities, then conventional assessments do not match that program philosophy because they set children apart and they focus only on the child's disability. Oftentimes the conventional assessment leads to unbiased, unfair in inaccurate depictions of the child. Uh, they, uh, for example, if a child um, has cerebral palsy or intellectual disabilities and cannot speak, and a conventional assessment requires the child to speak to give us information, then if the child cannot speak, then the conventional assessment tells us that the child may have intellectual disabilities. However, if the assessment allows the child to provide us information in other ways, such as pointing or even an eye gaze or using pictures or using sign language, then the child might be able to demonstrate knowledge about what they know and the child will not be seen as having an intellectual disability. And so, we believe that just like I wouldn't give a test to a child in Spain in English because it would be biased, it would be unfair. It's also unfair to children with disabilities who cannot speak or cannot move around their environment, who can't see or can't hear to give a test that requires those children to use those different response modes. And so, so we want to have um, assessments that are not unfair um, and do not penalize a child because they have a disability. Oftentimes, the assessment items on conventional assessments also are not functional. They're not generalizable skills. 
For example, on many uh, conventional assessments, we may see tasks, for example, that say, you know, that the child will put beads on a string, or the child will put together a block tower, or the child will put together a puzzle, or the child will walk on a balance beam. Those are items on a test. However, many children <laughs> can have they do not need to know those skills uh, in order to be able to be functional in their environments. I often will say that I, I don't sew. <laughs> I don't sew. Um, I don't know how to sew things. So why did I ever need to learn to string beads on a string? I'm not a jewelry maker. I don't sew. So why did I ever need to learn that skill? I do need to know eye-hand coordination. I do need to know how to use a pincer grasp, but I don't need to know those specific tasks. With authentic assessment, we are assessing this underlying foundational skills that children need in order to be able to stack a tower, in order to, but also to be able to do other things like to feed themselves or to um, communicate with other people. They need those other skills. And so with authentic assessment, we're looking at the functions of the behaviors, not at specific tasks that a child may or may not do. In these pictures, I will show you an example. Um, one of the uh, things that I have been involved with for many years is that I began a children, a small children's home, a family home uh, for children that are orphaned and abandoned in Guatemala. And also I began an inclusive preschool program there. The little boy on the forefront here is Carlos. Carlos has uh, cerebral palsy and does not speak. And in order to get services for him in Guatemala, we had to take him to a center you can see I'm not very happy here because I wasn't. Uh, this is the psychologist here, and she was just doing her job. Uh, she talked for a few minutes with uh, the, the primary caregiver who had raised Carlos since he was an infant. She talked for a very few minutes with him and asked a few questions. And then she took him to another place, and she started asking him to do tasks. Um, his Carlos's hands do not work very well. He has difficulty. He could not walk at this time. And um, she removed us, um, you know, far away from him. And so he was very, he struggled with doing these tasks because he had not been asked to do these kinds of tasks before. Um, and so she did this with him. And then um, she also asked him to put the beads on the string. And she did other kinds of similar tasks with him for a period of time. Carlos was three years old at this time. And um, back at the home where he lived, he was able to put puzzles together. He was, the, he was a great problem solver. He let people know his wants and needs by pointing and using vocalizations. But after um, probably 45 minutes with Carlos, the a psychologist delivered a report to us that said that Carlos was uh, functioning like a six month old child. Um, and we knew that this was not correct. We knew that Carlos had more intellectual ability to this, that he had ways to communicate uh, with us. And so when we remove child, you can even see in the in this picture, you see a small little tear in Carlos's uh, eye here because he was very frustrated um, in this uh, conventional assessment model. And so when we observe him in the environments in which he is comfortable with the materials that he's comfortable with alongside people that know him, we know that Carlos has uh, much more ability than what this particular assessment told us. But this was necessary for him to receive uh, some of the services, unfortunately. So I think it's a good example that contrasts the kind of assessment we're talking about. Uh, so the next thing that we want to see is to talk about some of the advantages of authentic assessment, and they are that it measures the child's uh, true abilities about what the child can do and cannot do. Um, it gives us different components of the child's learning so that we can see many skills all at the same time. We're going to be talking also about the strategies. Rather than giving a child a task and saying, do this, authentic assessment allows us to use interviews with the families and the caregivers that know the child well and observations in the natural environment. Um, we can also have planned or unplanned opportunities um, for, uh, we can set up situations uh, to allow us to gather some information of the child.
Um, we can also, what, what we get from an authentic assessment is it provides us with an opportunities to plan instruction and to identify goals for the child that are meaningful to the child's family. An authentic assessment also allows us to collaborate with the, between the caregivers and the therapist and other people that will work with the child. We say that authentic assessment is appropriate because professional wisdom tells us it is, that it matches what we know about development. Young children do not perform upon demand. If you are a parent and you take your parent, the ch your child uh, to their grandparents and you say to the child, sing a song for your grandparents or say your ABCs to the grandparents. Oftentimes children will not do that because they don't do, they don't operate that way. Uh, children do not like to be told and to do things upon demand. Um, there are also many committees that have been formed to tell us that authentic assessment is the best way to uh, provide uh, assessment to children. And also, as I mentioned, there has been research to show that. And in the United States, we have legislation that suggests that we need to observe children in their natural environment. So now we know uh, what authentic assessment is, and we know um, why it's important. So let's talk briefly about how we do it. Um, first of all, some of the things that we need to consider is that we need to use a high quality curriculum based assessment uh, in order to do authentic assessment. It is one thing to just observe children in their natural environment, but the information that we gather from children as we observe them needs to be captured on an assessment tool that tells us about the child's development, that tells us this is what I need to teach the child next. This is the next important thing that the child needs to, to do. Um, the next thing is we need to use authentic assessment strategies, and finally, we need to collaborate. So I want to tell you um, just a little bit more about, uh, about a, a high quality curriculum based assessment. Uh, a high quality curriculum based assessment is one that promotes collaboration. It also assesses children across all areas of development, their gross motor skills, their fine motor skills, their social communication skills, their social emotional skills. So it's a very comprehensive assessment. It's also equitable in design, meaning, as I mentioned earlier, that it allows for adaptations and accommodations and modifications for children with disabilities because it looks at those functional skills. A high quality curriculum based assessment is one that is also has a research base. It is technically adequate, we say. In other words, it has been examined to determine that the order of the skills is appropriate to development, um, that it is valid and is reliable for the tools that we do it for. And most importantly, a high quality curriculum based assessment is one that gives us information to plan an intervention, to help us uh, useful into identifying goals and identifying strategies to support the child with a disability. In my other work that I've been doing here in Spain, I've been sharing with groups about a, a system that I am a co-author of called the uh, assessment and evaluation programming system. And this is a system uh, that is for children that are between the ages of birth to six years of age. It, 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 it looks at development across all of that age skill. It is a test first and foremost, but it is a test that can be administered authentically by talking to caregivers and by observing children in their natural environment. It is useful in developing um, uh, individual goals for children so that we are able to design interventions within the natural environment. So um, there is a curriculum that is associated with the AEPS that is uh, conducted within routines and activities that are part of a young child's natural environment. And it is also a tool that helps us monitor the progress of children. If you are um, perhaps interested in being part of ongoing research that is being conducted in Spain on the AEPS, then I invite you to uh, go to this uh, Gmail uh, address and you can sign up to be part of a field study that is being conducted in collaboration with colleagues here in Madrid and also in Valencia.
Uh, so also, I want to talk for just a minute about the strategies that we use to collect information uh, that are authentic. There are two, observation and also um, interviews with the caregivers. Observations allow us to determine the interest of the child. Uh, children are going to learn best when they are engaged in motivating preferred activities using materials that they enjoy. And so if I want to get the most precise, the very best picture of who a child is, then I want to engage them in activities that they are interested in with materials that they enjoy doing. Also, through observation, it will give us information about how to communicate with the child and how to interact with the child. Every child is unique, whether the child has a disability or not. Every child is unique, and every child likes to be interacted with in unique ways, and high-quality observations allow us to do that. Also, um, observations allow us to identify the strengths of the child and the emerging skills of the child. In order to do a high quality observation, then we need to know what it is that we are trying to learn about the child. Am I interested in finding out about the child's social communication skills? Am I interested in learning about their social emotional development? What is it that I want to focus my observation on? And of course, a high quality curriculum based assessment tool will help you do that. As I mentioned, we want to do this within a familiar environment and we wanna do it for a long enough period of time so that we can get the information that we need. If possible, it's always wonderful to be able to do an observation with multiple team members. Uh, with, with if the child has social communication delays, for example, to do that with a speech and language pathologist, to do that with the family, to do that with others that know the child well. If possible, um, it's wonderful if you might be able to record the observation so that you can look at it later uh, to see uh, what it was that the child was doing. And you want to get sufficient observations so that you will summarize the information and you will be able to uh, determine whether or not the results, what the, the results tell you to do next with the child. Um, I'll show you just about a minute of this, and just uh, this is a little boy. This is in our center in in Kentucky. This little boy um, is deaf or has a is hard of hearing, and he, he had cancer as a young child, uh, and also uh, he has a diagnosis of autism. And this is in his classroom, and. I, it, you, I just want you to just see this was an observation that we used to collect some assessment information from him. There you go. Do you have more time? Uh oh. Where do you think you can make it stick? Where does it stick over here? Interesting. It's stuck over here. Is there more space, I guess? Wesley, you want to help him? You can help him. Is it going to stick there, do you think? Or does it, is there too much space here? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a couple of others. Let's take this out. That is right. You're right. Let's see about this one. All right, I've got a couple of others. All right, I don't have a lot of them, I have a couple of others. I have a sheep. Did you ask him if he could play with them? Can he play with you? He really likes them. That's very kind. Can you play with them and be very gentle with the house? Dude? Here you go. You can use the sheep. <laughs> all right. I don't see that at all, Violet. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we also have some ability or rebuilding. 
So in this video, what you're able to see, uh, if I'm looking at this to assess, I can see that um, I can see Jude's per, uh, persistence with task. I can see his acceptance of help from his peers. I can see his problem solving skills um, because he was trying very hard to put the pieces uh, together. I can see that he is pretending to play. I can see um, that he has difficulty initiating a social interaction with his peers. Um, I can see that that um, he is trying to join in, but he doesn't have the words at this point to be able to do that. And so in a very, very short amount of time, if I know what I am looking for, early cognitive skills, social communication skills, social emotional skills, then I am able to look at that and I'm able to focus my observations so that I am able to uh, gather some important developmental information about the child. So observations, if they are done correctly, can be useful to give us information. And then uh, the second strategy that we use to gather information is from families. And families can give us important information about the child. They can tell us about the routines and the interest of the child and how the, what the interactions are like with the family. Um, they can also tell us about the perception of their, their perception of the child's skills, what they think their child is able to do. So many times people think that, think that families that they are unrealistic about their child's development. Um, and I don't believe that that's often true. I think that if we um, ask families the right questions and if we support their knowledge and learning of development, that they can give us wonderful information about their child. And most importantly, they can tell us what their priorities are, where we want to go next. If we want true collaboration between families and, and, and professionals, then we have to start at the beginning when we are doing assessment so that during the beginning, we are able to find out what they think is most important. Um, we can do our interviews with families through a structured or unstructured approach. Um, we want to use open-ended questions with families so that we get the most amount of, uh, information as possible. And most important, we need to understand the difference between a concern and a need. A concern is something that the family is anxious about. The families may say to us, for example, I wish that I could take my child out into public. I wish that my child didn't have temper tantrums. I wish that my child knew how to interact with his brothers and sisters. That is what they are anxious about. It is our responsibility as professionals to turn those concerns and to look at the needs, which are something we can take action on. What can we teach this child so that they can interact with others' environment? What can we teach that child? What can we take action on so that they can go out in the community? What can we take action on so that they are able to participate in activities at school? And so it's through those um, types of interactions that we can learn about the child. Um, very quickly, I've put some forms in here. Um, within the AEPS system, we have a family report that where we gather information about the routines, about what the family likes and doesn't like about that, why that, diff that particular routine is difficult for the family. Um, we also have a part of the AEPS that looks at the family assessment of child skills. And in this particular form, we ask families to tell us what they think about their child's development how they think their child is performing. Um, and it also, this is also a wonderful tool for how families can um, learn about development so that they understand that before my child can walk, which is something that many families want for their children if they are non, non if they are immobile, that there are certain skills that they need to learn next. So these are tools that are there. They're a little bit more structured that you can use to gather important developmental information about the children. I see that I am past time now, and so um, I'm going to stop with this quote from Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers is a very famous early childhood educator um, that had a, a, a television show for children for many years in the United States. Um, he was a very gentle, very kind person who talked a lot about friendship, uh, talked a lot about people getting along with one another. And Fred Rogers said, anyone who has ever been able to sustain good work 
has had one or more people to help them do that. Uh, people who believed in them. We do not become competent human beings without a lot of investments from others. And so I know that all of you who are out there are investing in young children. I thank you for that. And I appreciate this opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's, for us, it's been such an interesting information and you have been very clear. So it has mm -hmm. helped us a lot. Um, we, someone has uh, just, before you have shared the APs mm -hmm. tool, uh, tool uh, they have asked us from a preschool uh, teacher, mm -hmm. uh, which tools or instruments do you recommend us? So mm -hmm. you see the APs, yes. but I don't know if you have any other that it could be used. Yes. Uh, so uh, it really, it depends on what type of question that you want to ask. Um, for me, uh, the most important question is, how do I support the child's development? And in order to support the child's development, that I believe that the type of assessment that the AEPS is, is the type of assessment that um, is most important. There are assessments that that people use to screen children to see if they might have a developmental problem, or or there are assessments to, that people use to uh, see if the child has a disability in a certain area. However, for me, uh, the most important assessment question is how can I support the child's development and to understand the child's developmental status? And the a tool like the AEPS does this. Uh, this tool has been translated into Spanish, um, in, uh, and so if you want to learn, you know, about it, then you can do that. So. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have shared uh, by the chat the the link for them to, okay. to see and download the, okay. the tool. I don't know if it's the near, um, uh, any other question for Jennifer. You could just write it by the chat or into the question and answer. Apartment. There is another one. Someone is asking us, as soon as saying, uh, she's not sure if maybe it's a good question for you. I'm sure that it will be. Uh, they want to know what do you think if it's better integration in normal schools or special schools? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the big questions. Um, I have always promoted uh, inclusion of children with disabilities in. Uh, normal schools or gen general education. Uh, I think that uh, everyone benefits from that. I think that the children with disabilities benefit. I think that children without dis disabilities benefit. I also think that it's hard work. And I think that uh, teachers need support uh, in order to include children with disabilities. And maybe perhaps more importantly, they need the knowledge uh, for how to uh, support children. They need, uh, they need to understand that it takes practices from special education, it takes practices from general education blended together in order to support um, children in inclusive settings. And, um, and so I do believe it's hard, but I think that it is beneficial. Thank you very much. In Planning Region, we have the same perspective than you, and we are also working in, with the politics, uh, schools, mm -hmm. uh, families. So mm -hmm. for us, uh, the inclusion, we we say we used to say, Javier Tamari, which is an expert that worked here, he mm -hmm. used to say, there is not a complete education if it is not inclusive, not mm -hmm. only for the person with intellectual disability, but mm -hmm. for everyone. Yes. So thank you very much. Yes. We have two minutes left. I don't know if there's any other question. I think that there is no more. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Jennifer, for us has been, as I told you before, mm -hmm. uh, such a honor. And I think that it could be very useful for us knowing the, the uh, authentic uh, assessment, mm -hmm. which is and how could be implemented. We are also uh, reminding them to, if they want to be part of your mm -hmm. investigation, to your research, mm -hmm. just giving them the email. So thank you very much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.